Welcome to our Cell Culture Seminar. My name is Marina Wicklander and I'm a Field Marketing Specialist for Cell Culture Portfolio in Western Europe. During our seminar, we will provide you with tips and tricks on how to culture your cell lines, troubleshooting your cell culture in order to achieve reliable and reproducible source of data. First of all, we would like to give you an introduction into the cell culture and provide with some important historical events. From a historical perspective, a number of important developments led us to the current state of the research. Here we would like to mention only some of them. The first time the word cell appeared in a book Microglia, written by Robert Hooke already in 1665. Please take in consideration that the first cell line was discovered only in 1952. Harry Eagle was the first American physician and pathologist who established the first media, very famous currently on the market as the Eagle's Medium Essential Media in 1955. Everyone, of course, remembered Dr. James Thompson. Him and his group in 1998 were the first ones who isolated the first human pluripotent stem cells and they didn't just isolate it, they were also able to differentiate them in the three germ lines. Fast forward to eight years later, to 2006, to Shinya Yamanaka and his discovery of four transcriptional factors that play a key role in reprogramming somatic cells to the pluripotent cells. You all know that he won a Nobel Prize making his, that work. Also quite recently, you can consider it quite recently, around 2010, the 3D cell cultures were brought also into the world of cell culture. So what is next? There is probably some more things to come. So what is a cell culture and what is the objective? Basically, cell culture are the cells grown outside of their natural environment in a controlled condition. We all know that the cell culture is absolutely essential in research. It has helped us to understand the complex cellular physiology on how cells function and respond to stimuli, understand biological processes in order to prevent, diagnose and treat the diseases. Looking at the cell culture workflow, let's look at it from an experimental perspective when you're ready to prepare cells for an assay or experiment. The first thing you will do is sort out an existing stock of cells that are cryopreserved. Once you seeded the cells and they're recovered, we enter to this routine part of the cell culture. This is where you researchers will spend a lot of time feeding the cells, monitoring certain parameters such as confluency, the pH of the media, morphology, cell density, and many other factors. You also have an opportunity here to subculture or passage the cells when they are grown and expanded. You may split off part of your cell culture and expand for experimental purposes. You may want to manipulate cells in, by adding some potential therapeutic drugs and measure the effect on the cells by running an assay. Transfect, transfected with a gene of interest or any other manipulation. All will be later used to, to analyze dependent on the goal of the study. Also, if you go back a little bit to step two, you may also want to cryopreserve your cells so that you can have a stock, uh, frozen stock for later on use. In order to produce reliable and consistent data, make sure that your lab and all your colleagues follow the good cell culture techniques. Only in that case, nothing can affect your data. Make sure that you follow the aseptic technique and all your personnel as well as equipment are sterilized and sterile. And that includes not only the laminal hood, but uh, that you wear the sterile gloves, that you wear laboratory coats and all the other needed equipment. Also, everything to grow the cells saying whether it's pipettes or cell culture vessels needs to be sterilized and protected from any kind of infection and uh, contamination. Now we would like to talk about your cells. What are you planning to choose? What type of cells are you planning to select for your experiments? 
Once you decided on your experiments, you need to choose what type of cell lines you would be working with. And it is a very important step before you order any kind of media, growth factors or supplements, because only the type of cells will determine all the rest uh, reagents. You can work with the primary cells. They are usually isolated from the patient tissue or healthy individual and way more biologically relevant. However, they do have also the limitations. It's more difficult to grow the primary cell lines and also they have a short lifespan for about five to six passages. After that, you would, you would need to acquire new cells. Cell lines, or as we call them, immortalized cells, can be cultured for a very, very long time. Very consistent source of cells and pretty easy to modify as well. However, they also do have a limitation. They are not as biologically relevant as the primary cells or the stem cells. They do have a genetic drift and also authenticity might be a really in question here. So take that in consideration as well. Stem cells currently considered the most biologically re relevant source for studies, not so easy to work with uh, however, they're really um, potentially used for, for gene editing and other manipulations as well. If you decided to choose immortalized cell line, make sure that they're biologically relevant to your model. As I mentioned previously, immortalized cell line have a tendency for the genetic drift. You can order the first genetic material, either DNA, RNA, or cDNA, and make a screening for the gene of your interest. Here is an example for androgen receptor screening. Researchers previously used THP1 uh, DUCAP cell lines and wanted to know if the receptor was expressed in other lymphoblast monocytes and hepatic cell lines. The test was performed on 15 ECAG cell lines. And as you can see in this experiment, in a, in a PCR, nine out of 15 contained androgen receptor. Researchers decided to dig a little bit deeper in order to identify the expression level of, of the androgen receptor using Quantif RT PCR. And based on that results, they could confirm that four cell lines indeed had an expression of androgen receptor and they could use them in their research. It is very important to go through the screening process before you acquire the new cell line that ensures that this cell line is actually relevant for your assay. If you decided to work with a mortalized cell line, and as I previously mentioned, the cell authenticity can be really an issue. You remember I mentioned that the cell line culture starts from 1952 when the first cell line, called the HeLa cell line, which takes the name after the patient Henrietta Lacks, was established in John Hopkins Memorial Hospital. Since that moment, there was like an explosion of discoveries of cell cultures. And you probably heard the story as well that there was a lot of HeLa infection or contamination by HeLa cell line were identified later on in a lot of cell cultures. Please be aware of that as it's been estimated that approximately 10 to 20% of the cell lines are contaminated with HeLa cell line. But it's not only HeLa which is a problem. There can be other cross-contamination and misidentified cell lines. Due to this problem with, with contamination and misidentification of the cell lines, several guidelines for the cell line notification has been put in place and is being supported by ICLEAC and NIH. And a lot of publishing groups, for example, as a nature publishing group, have now guidelines when you submit in the paper, it is absolutely required to provide identification of the cell line you've been using for your experiments.
So what is the most common cause for cross-contamination or misidentified cells? One of the reasons can be an intentional inoculation of original cell line with invasive cell line. And that very often happens when researchers are working with several lines at the same time. And I know with our research, it's very difficult to work with one cell line, but at least when you do a media change or when you do any kind of manipulation with cells, we would strongly recommend recommend you to work with one cell line at a time and try to clean the surface in between the different cell lines. The handling of pipette is very important as well as any other reagents which are around you. We do strongly recommend to have a dedicated media reagents and any other supplements for the single cell line at the time to prevent from any type of cross-contamination. Another reason can be as well, as we all know, and we work in the lab and we meet someone during a coffee break to find out that they're working with a cell line, which might be interested for you. It is very nice to have a nice uh, environment in the lab. However, when you acquire the cell line from, from your friends, colleagues, or any other collaborators, it is very important to make sure that you authenticate the cells before you start experiments, because it might be that something went wrong in their, in their lab. So in general, we, we recommend that it's uh, way more safe for you and for your research uh, to acquire the cells from the cell bank repository, like ECAC, for example. But if it's not possible, if you really want to use um, your collaborators, please do uh, authentication before you do the experiments. The mislabeling of the cryovials or even the culture vessels can lead also to misidentification and cross-contamination as well. Make sure that all your vials, all your cell culture labware is properly marked and it comes also to the, as I mentioned previously, to dedicated media and reagents as well. So you don't have any chances of uh, cross-contaminating between different cell lines. And last and not least also, as I mentioned previously, if you're working with immortalized cells, the genetic drift, if you can continuously passage in the cells, might occur. So if you suddenly realize that the genetic level or the morphology of the cells change a lot compared to the cells you were culturing a year ago, it might be the reason. So you have to create a master cell bank and then create from the master cell bank a working cell bank to make sure that all your cells are exactly at the same passaging level to preserve uh, the cells from any genetic drift. Cell authentication, as I mentioned before, is a very, very big part and important part in, in cell culturing. As I said already, uh, a lot of journals as well as a lot of uh, grant applications require if you're working with immortalized cells to authenticate the cells to make sure that all in all your experiments, the cells you started working with if you're done during during process any manipulation and at the end are exactly from the same origin. The cell authentication is done by STR profiling, which stands for the short tandem repeats. And as you probably know, it's international reference standard for this human cell line. Here on the image, you can see how the STR profiling looks like. STRs are re repeated regions of DNA found throughout human genome, and they really they have really high variability between uh, individuals. If you are capable of doing this in your labs, you're more than welcome doing that. It's not a very difficult uh, experiment. However, it might be quite difficult to read the STR profile. So in that case, we recommend you, if it's possible, to send your cells, for example, to the repositories like ECAC, and they can do this, uh, uh, this service for you and give you uh, a results back. However, uh, try to keep it in mind. It is very important to keep the cell uh, authentication under control.
long-term pathogen can lead to a genetic drift and as well abnormalities in the chromosome. So it is very important to run uh, the test to identify uh, the genetic integrity and stability. As you might know, chromosomal changes, they might overtake the entire culture. And in that case, you will see a lot of gross behavioral changes as well as changes in morphology. And that can lead also to inactivity accurate results. As I mentioned, it is a possibility that you will see a big genomic, big changes between uh, behavior yourselves from now and uh, one year ago. In the next part, we want to look what else can affect your cells. So we talk about how important it is to choose the right cell line, how important it is to I, to make sure that your cell is authenticated and there is no cross-contamination because it can really affect uh, the results of your experiments. Now let's look at other reagents in your, in your cell culture which can really affect the cell growth. As we talked from the beginning, cell culture are the cells which are growing outside of their natural environment. So it is very important to create the right environment for the cell cultures so they feel comfortable, they grow and provide us with valuable and reliable information. Now that we choose the right cells, I would recommend that you acquire them from reputable source like ECAG to make sure that they're authenticated and clean and have no any contamination. The next step is to acquire all the medias and supplements which are necessary in order to grow the cells. As you know, cell culture media provides nutrition, provides osmotic balance, and also maintain the proper pH. There are a number of classical medias and special medias dependent on the cells you will be working with. It's not a secret. You can easily go on any repository or even our website and see what type of media needed specifically for your cell type and also which other supplements needed in order to uh, add to cells so they can grow as happy as possible. Please order all your cells and media and reagents before you saw your cells. So everything is ready for you. FBS is also very important. It delivers nutrients and growth factors and attachment factors. So you need to add those in the right concentration. There are other supplements like glutamine, uh, HEPAS, Antibiotics, we are not really you, uh, recommend to use antibiotics. However, some medias they absolutely acquires that. And also there is a number of growth factors which are needed in order for the cells to feel happy. If you need any more information or any products from this, please uh, look at our website and I will try to help you as much as possible. Once growing your cell, it is very important to keep your cell in physiological conditions and pH is one of the very important elements. As you know, phenol red is added into cell culture media to indicate the pH level. The normal range of pH level is between 7.2 to 7.4 and it's controlled by uh, different um, uh, parts by buffering system like bicarbonate, but it's also controlled by CO2 level in your cell culture incubator. So if we look at this image, for example, if you if you see that these cells are cell made it suddenly turn so yellow, it means that the pH will will be very low due to release of lactic acid, and it means that the media needs to be changed immediately. If you have between seven 7.4, as you can see here, it's a, it's a red, 7.4, it's a red, this is what you see in the bottles, what you see uh, on the second uh, at 7.0, this is something uh, you can see already that um, the media started um, uh, turning a little bit yellow, it's still safe to keep uh, cells in that media as well, however, probably tomorrow you would need to change the media already. 
And if we look at the last one at 7.8, you can see that the higher pH may indicate that there is a very high level of ammonia from uh, glutamine or there is uh, some changes in the CO2 levels in your incubator. So maybe this is a time for you to change to check if everything is okay with your incubator. Make sure that your cells feel comfortable, that it's the temperature in the incubator is optimal. As you know, the optimal temperature for the mammalian cells is 37 degrees. I just previously mentioned that the CO2 level is also very important. And in that case, you will see the changes in the color of the media. Here is an example. Uh, as you can see below, uh, when the temperature in the incubator was wrong. If you wonder on the first image with a little bit like reddish color, uh, what does it look like? It actually looks like um, metal bars in the incubator. You can see that it was so cold in the incubator that the cells were hiding on those metal bars. And the second image, which is a little bit bluish, you can see it's exactly the opposite reaction. It was so hot in the incubator that the cells were trying to hide in between those metal bars. So try to avoid any kind of um, extreme temperatures or extreme CO2s. Make sure that you, you control in your incubators as well, because when cells under stress, you, you probably will get also a wrong response from them when you do any kind of manipulations for your assays later on. We have a different type of cells. Some of them, they're growing in suspension. Some of them are adherent cells. It's very important to understand your cells, to know what your cells are needing and therefore choosing the right environment for them. Some cases, as you know, as you see here, the research uh, the researchers grow in the cells directly on the plastic. It's very inexpensive, and it's less sensitive cell lines, such here to 293, for example. Sometimes researchers realizing that the cells do not feel so comfortable and they need a little bit more help in order to grow, in order to uh, divide. In this case, uh, researchers will pre-code the cells with some attachment factors uh, such as collagen, vibronictin, or laminin. These two are traditional two-dimensional cell culture. There is also a possibility of growing the cells on the membranes. As an example here, we have a hanging inserts, we have a standing inserts, and in that case, cells are growing on the membrane and they will receive the media from the bottom and from the top and grow almost like in a, in a 3D environment. There are also possibility of growing the cells in a 3D dimension as well, and this is something we talk in our other presentation. So if you would be interested, look at our 3D cell culture presentation. In that case, it's uh, more mimicking the in vivo environment compared to the 2D cell culture. And we do have a number of different hydrogels which can help you to achieve uh, that level of growth. So now we selected the cell lines which we need to work with, which are relevant for our research. We chose the media, the supplements, the growth factors. We checked that we all, our incubator is working well, the temperature is correct, the CO2 level is correct. Uh, we selected also whether we need to grow the cells in suspension or whether use any attachment factors or any kind of hydrogel. Now is the first step in the growing your cells and the very important cells is to sow the cells correctly. And it's very, very important part. So we check the cell la line uh, data sheet we need to prepare the flask. It needs to be pre-warmed with all already the growth factors and supplements uh, in it. And then we put the cells into the water bus and we suggest to do it very fast at 37 degrees. And the reason to that, because I hope you remember that one of the components for uh, in the cryopreservation is a DMSO. And DMSO is 
very toxic. Also, if you're working with the stem cells, it also leads to differentiation. So it is very important to sow the cells very fast in the water bath and try not to use your hand or to use an incubator. Water baths doing it fast and easy. Pipette the cells into a sterile tube and slowly add pre-warmed media. It is a very important step as well. Especially for the suspension, uh, we recommend after to use a centrifugation to remove any traces of DMS or any traces of cryopreservation. Also, as I mentioned, because it, if you're working with the stem cells, it can be really important part, very important step for you because DMS or can differentiate can cause differentiation of the stem cells. So do it, uh, do it fast. Do not spin uh, at the very high levels. You remember you spin it only at 150G. So uh, to remove the media. And after that, you transfer into appropriate volume vessel to achieve desired density. It is also very important to calculate your cells or to know how many cells you have in the vials so you add appropriate level of the media. Otherwise, um, they will eat up the uh, growth factors and supplements too fast and you will see that the media will change yellow too fast. You need to incubate it at 37 uh, degrees and of course examine your cells, check your cells that they feel comfortable after 24 hours. If you see the poor attachment of your cells, if you're working with um, adherent cells, there might be a reason to that. There might be that some there are some factors which are preventing them from attachment. It, it might be either contamination or there are some changes in, uh, in the temperature or CO2 in your incubator. So all these things you need to take as a sign that uh, something is disturbing the normal cell growth because the usual media serum and supplement they should help cells to attach as i mentioned also you can use as i say as i said an extra set matrixes or attachment factors like collagen or fibronectin or laminin in order to enhance attachment and growth of the cells use it as a control you know, mycoplasma contam contamination is the cell culture's worst nightmare. The reason to that is because we cannot see it with our naked eye. Mycoplasma is a very small bacteria without the cell wall, and it means that even if you use an antibiotics in your cell culture, you wouldn't be able to, to kill that bacteria. It's really uh, has a high range of survival. That is why it's very important to keep all your meters and supplements sterile and all your hoods cleaned uh, to prevent from any contamination. Mycoplasma may lead to uh, alteration of the in morphology or alteration in the cell growth. It can cause also chromosomal aberration, and it might not. But the major reason, major problem with mycoplasma contamination, that it will always invalidate your results. And as I mentioned now, also for the journals, if if you're showing that you're working with a cell culture or if you're applying for the for the grant as well, they will always require your test for mycoplasma contamination and it can really damage your reputation as well. So the testing is absolutely required for the mycoplasma contamination. There are a number of uh, tests uh, you can apply. There is either cell culture isolation or the PCR reaction or the staining by a uh, Hearst. So try to do it uh, during all your uh, research procedures to make sure quite regularly, maybe once a month or every other week to make sure that you do not have any mycoplasma contamination in your cells. Compared to mycoplasma, which you cannot see with a naked eye, there are other type of contaminations which are pretty visible, such as bacteria, yeast and fungi. If you see any kind of cloudness or you can see that there is a changes in pH, uh, always check it under microscope and make sure that you do not have any contamination. If you do have a contamination or you're not really sure, as we say, when adapt, just throw it out. 
don't do it, don't use it. To prevent from any kind of contamination, as I mentioned, always work in a biosafety cabinet and clean, uh, disinfect all your uh, equipment which you work in, use, it with sterile, use sterile filtration from the media, for the reagents, make sure that everything is clean around you. So if you rule out the contamination, but you still see the cloudness in your media, it might be that it's precipitation of some proteins or other components in the media. It can be really harmful for the cells and can be very harmful for your uh, downstream application as well. So it is very important to identify what causing these kind of problems. It can be due to the uh, temperature shifts, you know, the freezing and sowing of the media can lead to precipitation of the proteins. It might be that there is some water loss as well due to the evaporation, so wrong, uh, wrong temperature in the a wrong temperature in the incubator it can be an effect of the calcium salts that they were not properly dissolved before added into media or it might be that you added some metal supplements and they can precipitate as well so make sure that you your media is as perfect as possible to provide the best environment for the cells Another issue we hear from the, our researchers is the clumpiness of the cells. And it can really affect the results of your experiments because if the cells clump too much, they don't have such a good access to the critical nutrients and which can affect their uh, overall expression as well as the cell growth. So it is very important to analyze um, and understand your cells and see how you can prevent from clumpiness. The cause of clumpiness can be different. Either there's a cell lysis and DNA release, and in that case you can add DNA as one in order to prevent it in some type of cells. Uh, it can be also due to bivalent cations, so in that, uh, in such as uh, citrate and EDTA can be added uh, to remove uh, the extra calcium, which might come from, uh, from serum or other balanced salts. Cell density is also very important, so try to check some publications or literature what would be the recommended uh, cell density. And also the handling of the cells. It is very important to use appropriate centrifugation settings and also uh, gentle um, work with, uh, with some of the cells. As I mentioned during our sewing procedure, that it is very important to count your cells, to know how many cells you have in the vial. And the reason to that, that we think that it is very important to keep a growth curve as internal control. As you can see on this growth curve, uh, you see the logarithmic phase when the cells are doubling over time, and then they come to the stationary plateau and eventually to the death. Why it is important to know uh, the, the, the cell growth curve? The reason to that, that you will be using those cells for your application, and also you would want to freeze your cells for the, for the future. So if you need to use those cells later on, they will be at their best. And usually the cells are collected at the end of the logarithmic phase, because this is where you have most of the cells very viable and in strong health, and not so many dead cells you would hope for. Another reason why you would do this the growth curve as well, because cells are very consistent, and if they have a proper media, proper temperatures, and all the rest in order with all the supplements, uh, the growth curve will be repeating itself. And if you suddenly notice that the cells started growing poorly or opposite, they start growing too fast or they're not so viable anymore. It must be, it might be that there is some kind of issues with the cells. Dyser can be uh, contaminated. As I mentioned, mycoplasma is not visible and you cannot see it. It might be that you have some issues with an incubator. As I mentioned, the temperature can be a problem, the humidity level, maybe there is some vibration next to the 
incubator as well. It, it might be also that um, something else is uh, making your cells unhappy with the media or the supplements. So the growth curve is a very, very nice internal control for you. Now that we have our cells growing, uh, let's look at the pathogen and how important it is can be for your, uh, for your applications and uh, analysis. As I mentioned before, it's quite easy to pass it the cell if you know your cells. Growth curve will, give, will provide you with that information and makes your, will make your life easier in the lab. So once you examine the cells, identify whether they are at 80% of their confluency, that is usually should be at the end of the logarithmic phase. As you know, trypsin is un inactivated in the presence of serum, so it is very important that you remove all the uh, all media before you add trypsin. Wash it with PBS as well. Then you need to detach the cells from the vessel by adding trypsin or any other um, detachment factors which you would be using in your lab. Resuspend in fresh media and then seed the, the cells in a new vessel. Trypsin is the most common reagent used currently in the in the labs. However, there are other substitutes like Acumax as well. There is an easy lift if we are talking about the stem cells. So depending on your cell line, you would need to find the best reagent for your cells. In that case, you might require to test them, uh, to analyze them and see what works the best for you. As I mentioned, the trypsin protocol is quite easy. You do need to remove first the media because it will contain uh, the serum which will affect uh, trypsin otherwise. Wash it with PBS, add pre trypsin. Please do not um, ban uh, the plate on the table. Just let it incubate for two, three minutes in the room temperature. If it needed, you can put it also in the incubator if you see that it's a little bit difficult for the cells to detach. And then once they detach, add pre media to neutralize trypsin. You can centrifuge the cells, count them, check out their viability, add the fresh media at the appropriate density and put them in a, in a fresh uh, flask. I would like to stress it a little bit more. It is very important to count your cells, to analyze the viability of your cells, because all your downstream applications depend on that, on the quality of your cells. Hematocytometer is one of the most common use method for counting. In this case, you need uh, to use the Tripen Blue uh, to assess the viability. You need to be aware that Tripen Blue is um, is a toxic and uh, potentially cancerogenic as well. So, if you have any other ways of counting the cells, please do that as well. Uh, we do have also automated cell counter, it's called Scepter, it's fast and convenient and in this case you, you take cells directly in the media so you don't have to, um, you don't have to uh, add any drip and blue or um, any other things. There are a number of manipulations you can do with the cells uh, once they're growing and once you achieve a number of cells you need for downstream applications. We wanted to give you just one of the examples of what you can do with the cells and that would be transfection. As you know, transfection is a process to introduce DNA, RNA or protein into eukaryotic cells. And we have two types of transfection, whether we have a stable transfection or where we have a uh, transient transfection. The stable transfection, when the, the, the construct which you design, the, the, which includes the gene of your interest or protein of your interest, will be integrated into genomic DNA and it will have a long-term expression. And this application may include protein production and generating model cell lines for drug discovery, for example. The transient transfection transfection. In that, in that case, there is no integration in the host genome. It's very short term and usually the application may include the pathway analysis where the long-term long expression is not needed. 
So when you plan in the transfection, there are a lot of things we need, which you need to take in consideration. First of all is the method of transfection. As you know, there are different type of them and it all depends what are you planning to achieve, whether you want to do the transit transfection or where we're talking about stable transfection. Depending also on the cell types, the method is also very important. As you probably know, for example, the blood cells, it's almost impossible to transfect them with anything than uh, viral vectors. So always think about this, what type of cells you're using and what you're trying to achieve. So the methods we are currently have is either chemical and one of the most common, probably the lipid based uh, transfection. There is a physical transfection like electroporation. Viral methods are very popular, especially when we're talking about stable transfection because viruses tend to um, integrate into host genome. Particle based assays such as nanoparticles as gold is also used as well. Think about the, also the purity of the construct uh, that can really affect the quality of transfection and the efficiency as well as the amount and the dilution media. If you're working with a CRISPR modification, they absolutely require the transfection and it would be very critical what type of method you will be using for transfecting the CRISPR into the cells. Cryopreservation is also a very important step in your cell culturing and you can imagine why. The reason to that is that eventually you would need to take that vial out of liquid nitrogen and start growing those soils again. So you need to make sure that you did it in a correct way and your cells are in a good quality and viable. Now we're at step of cryopreservation and as previously mentioned it is a very critical step because eventually if you or your colleagues will want to use those cells in a year or two it's it's very important that the cells which you put in the freezer are viable and a good quality as well. It is important to choose your cryoprotectant. Uh, DMSO is one of the most common ones, but there are other ones available as well. All depends on your preferences and also quite often it's a historical tradition in the lab as well. First, as we mentioned, uh, we harvest the cells and uh, as I showed you before on a, on a gross uh, growth curve we harvest as at the end of the logarithmic phase because this is where the cells are absolutely at their best. Resuspend them the media and it is very important to count the cells and make sure that you have an equal amount of cells in each and every while. Please also do put it in your recording so even if you leave the lab and someone new will come they will be able to know how many cells you have in that file. You would need to centrifuge it for five minutes to get rid of any kind of traces of media uh, first. And then you resuspend them with your cryoprotectant. And as I mentioned, TMSO is usually one of the most common one used in the cell lines. And they usually have a formulation of 90 to 10 or 70 to 20 to 10. Again, it all depends on your um, uh, on your preferences and then uh, they pipetted in aliquot one milliliter into the into the vials and start with uh, slow freezing and usually they use the rate control freezers like Mr. Frosty usually in the labs or any other ones. Some are using the more um, uh, electronic ones, but the generally the rate should be minus one to minus three degrees a, a minute. And the, the slow freezing is very important because it's important to get rid of any water uh, left in the cells because it will otherwise it will turn into the into the icicles and will be absolutely harmful for the cells. Once the cells are frozen, they can be transferred into liquid nitrogen, into vapor phase of liquid nitrogen and kept there for a very long time. Please do keep all your recordings in order so people after you would be able to use those cells. Make a proper marking so it's, they also can find what type of cells uh, is frozen. 
just to summarize what we talk about in this presentation, we talk about the cell culture workflow. It is very important to keep ourselves happy. It's very important to do it consistently to achieve uh, reliable and reproducible information. As we mentioned, we start with the sowing and seeding the cells, feeding them, passaging them, monitoring them. Later on, we can either put them back in the freezer or do different type of manipulation, expanding them and doing the analysis as well. There are a lot of different type of analysis. I'm not going to go so much into the, into that one. You all do uh, different um, experiments. What I do strongly recommend you as well to request our fundamental techniques in the cell culture. It contains a lot of tips and tricks, also protocols on how to uh, work with the cell culture. It can be very useful for your students, for for you also to keep in the lab. And if you have any questions, if you need any tricks, you can always find that. We do that in collaboration with the ECAC. We've been collaborating with them for many, many years. In general, if you have any questions or you need any help, please do not hesitate to uh, visit our website, uh, contact our specialist. We will be more than happy to help you with the cell culture um, workflow. On this, I would like to thank you uh, for joining us on this seminar and good luck. <laughs>